Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Troy Moling, and thank you for joining us this week on Market Journal. Glad you could be here. We've got lots of great information to get to on this week's broadcast. And beginning the show today, according to a new estimate from Nebraska Farm Bureau, potential losses in the state's ag industry as a result of the coronavirus pandemic could reach almost $4 billion. To put that into perspective, that's more than 80% of Nebraska's entire budget. Nebraska Farm Bureau senior economist Jay Rimpey put the numbers together and joined me to discuss what it means for producers. The way to think of this is kind of a snapshot of looking at the potential losses, both realized and unrealized for farmers and ranchers. And what we looked at uh, were some of the major commodities produced in the state. And overall, we're looking at uh, revenue losses potentially of $3.7 billion. Now, that breaks up a couple different ways. One is uh, $2.4 billion of that is on the commodity side, beef, pork, uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, those kind of things. But we also looked at the ethanol industry too, because it's, a, as you know, a pretty major part of our ag economy in the state. And we made some assumptions about the rest of the year, the operating capacities and, and estimated their potential revenue losses from sales of ethanol and distillers grains of 1.3 billion. So that's how we came up with the, the 3.7 billion total. And that didn't even include uh, the spillout effects into the rural communities and the other, other economic impacts, multiplier effects that, that might occur. Are there any conditions that would need to be improved for us not to have losses at that proposed 3.7 billion level? Well, I, I think a couple things come to mind right away. Uh, one, there's or two or three things actually. One is part of the, the COVID was kind of a one-two punch. Uh, for agriculture. First punch wave came in eight, or met March when we saw the restaurant sector and the hospitality sector shut down and we lost a major source of demand there. We had to shift supply chains and, and that took some, some, uh, some effort and a little bit of time. And then the second wave came in April with the, the shutdown of the, the livestock processing, the animal processing facilities, pork and beef. And so uh, if we can keep those up and running at, at pretty much full capacity, if we learn how to do that, I, I think those, that would be tremendous. If we can see if people get back out and start buying gasoline again, of course, that means more ethanol sales, and then hopefully that'll pick up corn. And then the other big factor is export markets. Uh, we need those. Of course, this has been a worldwide pandemic. It's affected world economic growth. And anytime you see world economic growth affected, you're going to see trade affected. And agriculture is heavily reliant on trade, and, and we need those export figures to pick back up again, too. Do you have a breakdown as to how much of this $3.7 billion is due to COVID, or is, would part of that be due to losses that were already there from trade wars and the weather last year and just the market in general? How's all that breakdown? You know, uh, we don't have a break. I don't have it split out exactly a breakdown, but I've got to believe that most of it is due to COVID. The way we looked at it was we took prices that are coming into the year in January and compared them to prices in mid-May. And we made the assumption then, uh, we made some assumptions in terms of marketings between January and March or May, and then marketings for the rest of the year. And so most of the impact that we saw to prices had to be from COVID. Now, there were some underlying things in the markets that that uh, exacerbated the problem in, in terms of we had a lot of animals coming in this year, both pork and, and beef. And so any snafu in the processing sectors was going to mean, uh, it could mean major discounts in prices because of that. And we, we saw that. Uh, coming in there, we expected record beef and pork production. And same thing, we, we had a lot of grain in storage. We had some good crops last year. And so those exacerbated the problem. But I, I would say most of the impacts that we're seeing here are from COVID. And then when you look at a potential second wave of COVID this fall or winter, where does that leave us? Yeah, that, that's a fear. Uh, as we're looking at the economy starting to recover and you seeing some things pick back up again, that's, that's the fear of a second wave. I'd like to hope that we've learned a little bit through this first wave of the, of the COVID and when the second wave comes or if it comes, 
will be a little bit pre prepared, especially in terms of the food supply chain. And so the problems won't be as big as they were last time. But that is certainly a fear. And uh, we hope that doesn't happen both from a health standpoint and an economic standpoint, because we need we need these markets to pick back up. And, and so hopefully these, these uh, impacts that I'm estimating won't materialize. We've got a link on the Market Journal website to some more resources from Nebraska Farm Bureau that might be of interest to you during these times. And it's time for markets now, and Dr. Scott Brown is our analyst this week. He's the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the University of Missouri's College of Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources. He joined me on Wednesday to help us break down what's happening in the markets, beginning with any surprises in the latest WASDE report. So I guess for me, the, the biggest surprise or, or biggest change that I saw out of WASDE in June was that they did increase livestock production generally, um, more, more cattle, more hogs. Uh, and, and I think, you know, that's important because it sets the stage about maybe larger supplies in the second half of 2020, which could create some price pressure, especially relative to where WASDE was the, the previous month. So uh, gr growth in meat supplies is something that we're going to have to continue to pay attention to as we finish this year. And Scott, haven't had you on since we really started paying attention to COVID. I was looking at our show archives, second week of March. And I think for me, that's kind of when it clicked that the world kind of started paying attention to COVID. And it seems like we've been through so, so much since then. So I've been asking a lot of our analysts over the last several weeks when they come on, through your lens, how has the ag industry been affected the most? Well, I think when you look at uh, the, the ag industries, I always say the ones that, so meat processing uh, is, is one that jumps out to me. So really uh, more of a, a problem for those areas that have direct pathways to consumers and maybe direct pathways to food service is the right way to say that. As restaurants were shut down as a result of COVID-19, um, you know, that created bottlenecks that we've just never seen before. And I, I sometimes say when you think about at one week, we had 30 cent uh, pork bellies uh, that meant we were rendering some of those products to uh, just a few weeks later, we were three triple uh, the, the value of, of pork bellies. It's amazing the kind of changes that, that we've seen as a result of, of COVID-19. Uh, you can go a little further and say the corn industry hurt as well, right? With, with uh, us driving fewer miles as we were in that stay at home mode, it hurt the ethanol industry. We shut ethanol down. So it's, it, it's been those industries that I think had more direct consumer impacts that we've seen, uh, you know, the largest uh, negatives. And frankly, now we're seeing some of the other side. I look at dairy markets and I go cheese prices in the 250s range when they were a dollar a pound uh, just a few weeks prior just tells you just how volatile these markets have been. And you're talking about meat processing and particularly with pork and those slaughter bottlenecks that were impacting the industry. I've been reading where there's still a lot of uncertainty regarding when producers might see some profits there. Any advice for the folks watching who are pork producers? Yeah, so it's a really good question, Troy. I, I say when uh, you look at pork markets in particular, a couple of things here. Number, number one, it's nice to see maybe weights finally coming a little better under control. So maybe uh, we're getting a little more current. I don't mean that saying that that we're over the backlog of hogs. I think we have a lot of hogs still coming to market here between the uh, now and the end of the year. So uh, I worry about the supply side of, of pork markets. Um, I, I might suggest even larger pork production in the second half of 2020 than where USDA is at right now. Um, for me, the, the bigger issue is how much drag do we get out of the general economy at this point? Uh, you know, we've seen some of the job numbers. Some of that's positive some days, other days maybe not quite so positive. But when consumers have less money in their pocket, how does that affect things like pork markets? So I, I worry about the remainder of this year. Um, I, I say all the time is we get some positives. And what could be the positive to me is as food service maybe continues to come back to life, uh, we could see some demand pull. If we get enough demand pull and we get some higher prices, we ought to take advantage of that as pork producers. I guess as I get into early 2021, uh, maybe some of the pigs, baby pigs that we might have euthanized, sows that we may have aborted, uh, if we get a hole in terms of supplies, we could see that run up happen 
uh, in prices fairly quickly. So I, I'm still reasonably optimistic as we get into 2021, we'll see some better things on the pork side. And you mentioned that drag in the economy and not just the overall economy, but the ag economy. From an educational perspective, what are some things that educational uh, institutions like yours over at the University of Missouri, uh, like mine over at University of Nebraska, what can we do to train future ag leaders to adjust to this new world that we're living in? Yeah, uh, so it's a really good question, Troy. I, th I think n number one, it, it requires a broad uh, look at the industry. I, th I think we've often been very narrow in our own fields and we're learning that this is all connected. When you think about, uh, again, I, I said go meat processing, there, there's a lot of specialties from the time we talk about producing cattle until we ultimately get it on the plate from ag economists to animal scientists, to, you know, you name it. And sometimes we get so much in our own little world, I think, uh, that, that we weren't prepared for some of the questions that were going to come our way related to, to COVID-19. So I think the, the breadth of knowledge, understanding production agriculture uh, all the way through to the consumer is important. And, and we're going to learn more about how to have more flexibility. And I think that's something that some of our future leaders need to understand of how do you create more flexibility or better flexibility in this just-in-time system that we have in place in agriculture today. And finally, Scott, any marketing or risk management tips that you would like to leave us with today that we haven't talked about? Yeah, so I go take advantage uh, of price run-ups. There are, there's downside risk in many of these markets today. Um, I, I'll pick on dairy here for a minute uh, and come back and say, there might be some opportunities to lock in some reasonable prices. Why would I not take advantage of that today? Just given that I don't feel so comfortable about the future of any of these industries. Um, may not have the same opportunities right now, and especially hogs, but even maybe cattle. But if we were to get a boost in, in prices uh, as food service continues to open up, I, I just encourage producers, now's the time not to have a lot of risk out there if, if you can help it. So letting someone else have some of that downside risk um, might be something to, to be paying close attention to as we're not done. And a, and a second wave of COVID-19 could certainly put us back in a, a much more uh, dire situation as you look at uh, many of our ag industries. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Chad Hart from Iowa State University. If you have a question you'd like for me to ask him, email us or get in touch on social media, and I'll pass your question along. Next up, although acres have been declining, Nebraska is considered one of the top 12 wheat producing states in the nation, the primary market class being hard red winter wheat. Recently, however, growers in southwest Nebraska have shown interest in wheat of a different kind, that being spring wheat. Researchers note growers in the region are seeking a way to break weed and pest cycles and leave more residue in the field without going to a two year fallow winter wheat rotation. That's where spring wheat comes in. Read about the potential for spring wheat in the June Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. And Al, you're joining us today from the cool air-conditioned room, but we have been experiencing some hot weather this week. What's the upcoming forecast look like? Well, Troy, it has been hot, it has been windy, and we have finally started to see some rain break out across the state. The concern, of course, with this recent heat and high winds and the dryness issues, of course, worrying about abnormally dry conditions started to invade the state. I think it's a little bit drier than what the drought monitor is depicting, but overall, you can't argue with the trend we've seen all spring. And then with this precipitation, at least we're starting to get a little bit of opportunity to catch up on some moisture here because as we go out farther into the season, it certainly looks like a much warmer trend is in store for us. So the precipitation we've seen here starting Wednesday afternoon in the panhandle and working its way eastward is now going to be reinforced by some additional rainfall. And we're gonna to get to that right now as we go to the upper air models. As you can see, the upper air trough, which accounts for our precipitation is still moving through the state as we have energy rotating around that in the upper plains. Therefore, we have a surface low in southern Iowa and one also in western Nebraska. This is going to be able to consolidate precipitation across the southeastern one half of the state. 
And we'll see that shift through to eastern Nebraska as the day progresses, drying out in western Nebraska. And by tomorrow, we see that trough trying to flatten out somewhat. But we're going to have energy running around the southern periphery of it. With a low in the southern Texas, that should put, push up enough energy that we'll see some scattered precipitation across portions of northern and eastern Nebraska, but they should be fairly light. And as we move into Monday, we're going to see that northwest flow as that trough deepens over the western Great Lakes. A lot of action to our east and southeast with the precipitation. Some of that may linger around eastern Nebraska, particularly in the morning hours, but overall just amazingly cloudy and cooler conditions. Very comfortable, in fact. And then Tuesday, we just see that low sitting over the Great Lakes, deepening so much, but high pressure firmly in control over much of the central and northern plains. And one thing we'll worry about is occasional piece of energy rotating in the northwest flow, giving us a chance for scattered showers, but there's no overwhelming widespread precipitation expected. By Wednesday, we see that if north of the Great Lakes, it's got a little bit warmer air to start building into the western portions of the state, may start to return to the mid to upper 80s as we go into the midweek period. Then we kind of see things flatten out, but we look to our northwest, there's another piece of energy looking like it wants to come into the northern plains. And because we have such a broad trough, it's going to shoot some energy around that trough. So we have low pressure over northern portions of Nebraska expected to develop, generating major precipitation up in the northern plains. And then that trough rapidly sweeps toward the southeast. Low pressure along that frontal boundary forms in, in basically portions of Minnesota. This looks like it's going to generate a very significant severe weather outbreak for the northern plains and some of that will probably ride southward as we get into friday night and into saturday across at least the eastern half of the state so it looks like some very active weather is in store we go even further into the future we will see that that upper air low from next thursday to the following tuesday looks like it's going to hold and park itself over the eastern corn Belt, bringing a little bit more cloudiness and cooler conditions compared to the western United States where very hot conditions will start to build with that high pressure building into the southern portions of the Rockies and in terms of precipitation most of the major precipitation will be carved out with that upper air trough of the eastern corn belt but very dry conditions return to the southern plains some of that pushing up toward southwestern Nebraska. So Troy all the numerous opportunities for precipitation over this next 10 day period. And then it starts to look like it's going to turn much warmer and drier as we go into July. So we really need this moisture. Thanks, Al. Next up, the soybean gall midge began emerging in 2018 and caused measurable injury and yield loss to soybean crops in Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota, and Minnesota. It left producers and researchers reeling for answers to the threat. Now, the Soybean Gallmage Alert Network has been put in place to better equip producers and consultants with much-needed information to best manage the pest. Market Journal's Bill Dodd has more. In 2019, the Soybean Gallmage Alert Network was established to keep tabs on the adult emergence of soybean gallmage. This network has been at the forefront of keeping producers ahead of the threat by providing them with the most up-to-date data on the pest in the fastest possible manner. It allows us to send a, a phone call, text message, and email on an automated system. So I can type out a message and project that to what is now hundreds of, of farmers and co-ops and agronomists uh, about the first emergence of soybean gallmage in the network that we have established, which is quite actually large at this point. We're 34 sites uh, across four states. Uh, and so that provides people with an opportunity to uh, respond to this uh, and get the information as quickly uh, as possible. Getting this information out quickly and accurately is no small feat. It takes a team of researchers working throughout multiple states and institutions to gather and interpret the data that we can access at the push of a button. So the, the collective experience, which ranges from me, which is early in my career, to uh, others that have been around for, for quite a while, uh, allows us to ask questions, think differently, use our past experiences uh, to guide the questions that we're asking. And, and we're also able to engage with a lot of clientele that way and gather their information, which has been really critical to this whole process since we started. Um, and so we've been a, a, a pretty tight-knit group since, since this kicked off. Uh, and we actually received funding to add uh, 12 other states or 11 other states besides Nebraska into this. Uh, to determine if soybean gallmage is present in those states. And so that's been really important because the researchers in those states are being engaged on current information on soybean gallmage. So if it occurs in the state, uh, they can react fairly quickly. And you can see most of those 
our third instar larger larvae that are likely to uh, fall off and pupate pretty soon. And then if we've you got have dealt with this pest before, you probably already know you should be regularly scouting your fields. Once adult emergence begins, there's a very short window of opportunity for treatment. On the other hand, for those who haven't had it in their area yet, but may be on the lookout, Justin tells me early detection plays a crucial part in knowing how to prepare for the following that's, season. That's like typical symptoms before you peel it open. That black right at the soil surface. What stage you are in dealing with soybean gall mitch? If it's your first time looking for it and you've not heard about it in the area or saw any significant death, I would say that those growers, consultants, and others that are looking for it could wait uh, maybe even till late July or early August to see if there's any signs of it in the field. They're unlikely to uh, have to manage it this, this season, uh, but detecting it in the field might give them an understanding of what they may need to do next year. Um, for those that are dealing with it, um, rapidly scouting for it, uh, mostly following the alert system. We don't have a lot of time to respond to this particular insect in the field. Uh, so by the time we get an emergence of adults, uh, we found last year you have about 10 days to respond with a pyrethroid type insecticide to see any response. Um, and so that that's kind of limits the window. Uh, but consultants certainly within about 10 days, 10 to 14 days after we start to see adult emergence could start scouting fields to identify what fields are, are receiving injury and likely to be a problem during the year. Uh, things progress pretty rapidly. Within about 20 days, we have signs of wilting or death. Uh, and so following up on those fields the following week or weeks after uh, might give them an opportunity to say, maybe we should replant or plant in something just to avoid the tremendous amount of weed pressure that shows up when there's not a lot of soybeans growing in those areas. And it's an edge pest. So that's that first hundred uh, feet or so that really gets injured in the field. If you happen to have detected this particular pest for the first time and are currently making a management strategy for next season, one method for controlling the pest that has proven effective is waiting to plant your high-risk fields till last. Yeah, uh, so high-risk fields are fields where we saw injury in adjacent fields the previous year. So any signs of that injury, they, they can escalate fairly quickly. I've heard from a number of growers just a few dead plants, maybe five feet of death into the field, to the adjacent field farm the following year receiving a significant amount of loss. Uh, and so growers should be kind of noting that in the back of their mind. Um, and so it's really critical that they, they take that seriously in terms of, of looking for it and knowing whether or not it's there. Um, it, it's caught a lot of people, I think, by surprise. And, and although we don't fully understand this, I would uh, indicate that anybody who had hail in late July, early August last year uh, on soybeans. Watch those fields pretty closely. We've got a number of reports as well as some data of our own that indicate that it may boost uh, adult populations. Maybe they're attracted to those injured plants. That's been found in other species in this same genus this insect is in. Um, perhaps it's a coincidence. And so we, we really look to farmers and, and others in, in the egg community to uh, continue to help us understand whether or not that's something real or not. While researchers continue their hunt, Justin tells me now is probably the time to keep your eyes peeled in the field, as he expects adult emergence to begin sometime in mid-June this year. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Thanks, Bill. To sign up and receive alerts regarding adult emergence, send an email with your name, phone number, and email address to justin.mcmechan at unl.edu with the subject line SGM Alert network. If you've already signed up in 2018 or 2019, you're still on the list and you don't have to do it again. Finally today, post-emergence herbicides are a crucial piece for any producer's weed management plan. As a result, it's so important to accurately measure growth stage of your plants before any application. This is due to different herbicides having different restrictions based on corn growth stage or plant height. Failure to properly identify the growth stage could result in crop abnormalities. Add in a weather event like a late freeze or a hailstorm that results in leaf loss, and it's even more challenging. Well, growth staging at this point in the season can be a little bit more of a challenge just from losing leaves. We've seen leaves, lower leaves lost due to frost. We have natural sloughing off of those lower leaves that occur and um, hail and wind damage. So. At this point, it may be difficult for a grower to know what growth stage that corn is at. And so what we would recommend doing is digging up a plant inside the field beyond the end rows and slitting open that stalk 
in development staging, a lot of people don't realize that there are four nodes in the triangular base of that stock. So if you don't count four right there, a lot of times people will think of V8 plant, which could be on label for a herbicide application, is really V12 if you add the four nodes. And that's where we get into problems. With optimal growing conditions, a new leaf will typically appear every three to four days until tasseling. With this kind of predictability in development, one of the most common leaves practices is the leaf collar method. However, if you do this, leaves that have been lost must still be accounted for in order to properly identify the correct development stage. If um, you think about this is the stock and the collar is the leaf, if you can pull that collar away from the main stock of that plant, we would be able to consider that as a leaf that we count. And so we recommend the leaf collar method. And then again, when we start losing those lower leaves, we recommend slitting open that stock. Some of the herbicide labels will also give you a plant height. The problem with plant height though, is when we get cool, cool conditions like we've had the past month, we sometimes get shortened inner nodes because that plant isn't growing so fast. So height-wise, that plant may look to be a certain growth stage when it's really another. And that's why it's important to use the collar and the splitting open of the stops. If you'd like more information on the subject, you can visit cropwatch.unl.edu. We've also posted a link on the Market Journal website to an informative video that will take you step by step through the process of identifying the development stage. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. And don't forget, you can get the latest updates on the coronavirus outbreak at covid19.unl.edu. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.